This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You will hear a conversation between an officer of the Small Claims Tribunal and a consumer who wants to make a claim. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion, only the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Good afternoon. I'd like to lodge a claim. Certainly. Name? Emily Jane Appleby. Appleby? That's an unusual name. Sorry, what did you say your first name was again? Emily Jane. The woman gave her first name as Emily Jane, so Emily Jane has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Good afternoon. I'd like to lodge a claim. Certainly. Name? Emily Jane Appleby. Appleby? That's an unusual name. Sorry, what did you say your first name was again? Emily Jane. Now, Miss Appleton, could you please fill in this claim form? I've never done that before. Can you help me? Yes, of course. The first part is for your... The claimant's details. Where do you live? Um, at 1 Yoronga Street, Durham. How do you spell Durham? D-U-R-H-A-M. Of course, I should know that. But it's just one of those names that sounds quite different from the way you spell it. It is confusing. I've seen it spelt with two R's. And what's the postcode for Durham? 4105. Good. And do you work? No, not at the moment. Okay, so no work number. What about a home phone number? Yes, I can give you that. It's 7848-3762. 7848-3762. Seven, eight, eight. Three, seven, right. Now, this part here is for the respondent's details. Who's the respondent? The individual person, company, or business that you're claiming against. Is the claim against a landlord, tenant, trader, or driver? Well, it's a company that sells home appliances. So that's trader, then. Just a moment while I write that down. ABC Appliances, actually. Oh, now this part is really important. If the respondent is a company, you must have the company's full and correct name and registered address. I've looked it up on the internet, and it's ABC Appliances Limited. Good. If we don't get this part absolutely right, you won't have a legal claim. And their registered address? Yes, I've got that written down here. Just a minute. It's, um, 17 Brown Avenue. That's in Barden, isn't it? I think I know the place. My wife bought a vacuum cleaner there last month. Yes, Barden. Have you got the postcode for Barden? It's really similar to mine. Wait a moment. I'd better make sure I get it right. 4065. That's it. 
And what's the telephone number for ABC Appliances? Oh, um, 7232-4681. Good. Got that. Now, in the third part of this form, we get to the actual goods or services that are in dispute. I assume you made a purchase from them. Yes, that's right. On the 3rd of February, 2011. And did the goods have any sort of guarantee or warranty? Yes, but only for six months. So it was just a six-month warranty? Yes, they offered me an extended warranty for three years. But I would have had to pay extra for that. Oh, I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. You'll need to give a full description of the goods involved, the nature of the defect or fault, and any other relevant particulars. So, tell me, what did you buy? I bought a washing machine. Yes, but what brand, model, and serial number? The brand name was Mallard. And it was the Whisper model. Serial number, just a moment. I've got the warranty papers in my bag. Yes, here it is. Serial number XY303. Great. Now I need to know how much you agreed to pay. It cost a thousand pounds. Did you trade in your old machine? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. Okay. Now, what were you given for the trade-in? 250 pounds. So, in actual fact, the purchase price you agreed on was 750 pounds. That's right. And they delivered the goods two days later, on the 5th of March, and picked up the trade-in at the same time. Now, think carefully about this next question. What did the respondents say about the quality of the goods, or the way they would perform? The salesman who served me at the appliance shop said, the Mallard Whisper model has a much shorter cycle, so it uses less power. Oh, and he added, and it will also use less water. Is that true? Well, partly. It does seem to use less water, but both the wash cycle and the rinse cycle go on for much longer than my old machine, so I don't see how it can use less electricity. But the sales assistant also said, this model is whisper quiet. And is it? No, not at all. It's so noisy we can't hear the television in the next room. Excuse me, I have to answer that. Would you mind waiting? I'll get back to you in a minute. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part two. You will hear a local radio program about cycling courses in London. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14 on page 90. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. 
There's been a great deal of interest lately in encouraging people to use bicycles instead of cars as a means of transport. But not everyone is confident about riding a bike at the best of times, let alone in the middle of a city like London. Jack Hayes is a professional trainer who works for a London-based company, City Cyclist, which provides cycle training for the public. What exactly does City Cyclist do, Jack? Well, our basic purpose is to promote cycling as a sustainable form of transport. We believe the best way to promote cycling is to teach people to use their bikes safely and with confidence. In European countries, people all learn from their parents, and they also learned in school. And when I tell them I teach people to ride bikes, they laugh. They think it's crazy. But here in London, it's completely different. You're approaching the point where a whole generation of people have grown up not being allowed by their parents to cycle because it was considered to be getting too dangerous. And so, in turn, they can't teach their children. We believe in realistic training. So, if someone wants to use a bike regularly, say to get to work or school, we aim to train them by teaching them to ride on the actual roads they'll use so they can develop the basic skills they need and build up their confidence that way. At City Cyclist, we believe cycling's for everyone, no matter what age or level of ability or mobility. We do complete beginners and also advanced courses. That's for urban cyclists who want to deal with things like riding in streets with complicated intersections and things like that. We don't promote the use of personal protective equipment for cyclists, and we endorse the policy of the European Cyclists' Federation that parents should be allowed to make an informed choice as to whether or not their child wears a helmet. We believe the key to safe cycling is assertiveness, taking your place on the road. This has to be instilled right from the beginning. Assertive road positioning and behaviour is the key to safe cycling in congested urban environments. Some people are surprised that we don't promote the segregation of cyclists from motorised traffic, but we don't think that's practical in all urban environments. Instead, we teach people to use as much road space as they need to travel safely and effectively. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20 on page 91. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, as well as courses for individuals, City Cyclist provides a number of services for organizations. For example, we can deliver fun, safe cycle training activities at schools, arranging courses so that the disruption of curriculum time is kept to a minimum. As well as this, in order to promote safe cycling, we have provided training courses for employees and staff of local councils. And we are also increasingly looking at developing training courses in companies in order to help employers work towards green transport plans by helping to increase the number of staff cycling to work. Right, so that's a brief summary of what we do. If any listeners would like to find out more about the organisation, you can have a look at our website. That's City Cyclist. C I cyclist.co.uk and in order to book lessons you can either phone us on 020 7562 4028 or do it online there's an application form on our website and you can just download that and send it in we charge £27.50 per hour for one-to-one -one lessons plus £6 for each extra person so you're looking at just £39.50 for a family of three, say. If you've never been on a bike in your life before, we reckon we can get you riding in one hour. And for most people, a course of road training usually takes three hours. But whether you're a parent or a child, an individual or an institution, we'll be happy to discuss your special needs and make a program just for you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to part three. Zoe goes to talk to her academic advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now, listen carefully to the conversation between Zoe and her advisor and answer questions 21 to 30. How are you getting on, Zoe? Feeling at home yet? Mm, well, more or less. There are still some things I need to buy and I haven't found my way to all the facilities yet, but I really love the campus and I've already made a few friends. Fantastic. Now let's see what we can do to get your studies off to the right start too. You're on the foundation course, so you can take up to eight modules. What we advise is that you take four modules in the first semester, and assuming everything goes well, four in the second. Have you decided which you want to take in this semester? I haven't made my mind up yet. I can't decide whether to take Principles of Marketing or Introduction to International Trade. Well, that depends on your career goal. You're planning to work in the biotechnology sector, aren't you? Uh, well, that's my present thinking, but I guess I might change my mind. Right, well, marketing is a broad general subject that you will find really useful in a number of careers. International trade, on the other hand, is more specific. That's fine if you're sure it's the sort of work you want to do. A lot of students start off thinking about that option because it seems glamorous, but marketing can also be an exciting career, and there's a wide choice of jobs. Maybe you ought to wait until your career ideas are a bit more definite before you go down that road. Yes, I see. I could take international trade next year, couldn't I? Sure. You could do international finance as well. So, in your first semester, you've got principles of marketing, Introduction to Economics, Banking and Finance, and, let's see, Principles of Financial Accounting. How do you feel about that as a package? It's OK, I think, but I'm a bit worried about the maths. There'll be some statistics to do, won't there? Basic statistics, yes, but nothing more difficult than your last year of school maths. I know, but our math syllabus was a bit old-fashioned. Mostly algebra, geometry, trigonometry and stuff, hardly any stats. Right, well, it sounds as if you could do with the maths brush-up course. Can I arrange for you to attend just the classes on statistics, if you like? That'd be great. I didn't want to do the whole of maths again, but the stats classes would make me feel much more confident, thanks. Hang on a minute, there's one more thing. You're English. Now, you know you have to reach a satisfactory standard in English by the end of your first year to be allowed to go on to the main BSc course. Yeah, now I'm in an English-speaking environment, and I have to speak English all the time. I'm sure I'll be all right. It certainly helps, but speaking isn't everything. You'll have to get your reading up to the standards where you can understand the books on your course reading list quickly to get the information and ideas you need to write your essays. That means you have to develop a high level of comprehension skills. You'll never get through the course material if you try to read the books intensively from cover to cover. That's why our language skills development program gives you a series of graded academic texts to study and answer questions on a limited time. You'll probably find it hard at first having to work against the clock without a dictionary. How can I improve my skimming and scanning skills? Good question. For that, you'll have to do a range of specially designed exercises. Sometimes, these will be from a transparency, because it is often how the lecture material is presented. Sometimes, I think I'll never learn all the vocabulary. English is such an enormous language. I know what you mean. English is the biggest language ever, at least 350,000 words. Even Winston Churchill only knew 60,000, so they say. But as an academic student, you can get a lot of help from the academic word list by Avril Coxhead of Victoria University. That's in Wellington, New Zealand. I've studied word lists, of course, 
But how does this one help? The academic word list is based on a survey of three and a half million words of academic text. It contains 570 families of the words most commonly found in academic texts. Well, that's apart from the 2,000 most useful words in English. They come in a separate list. You can see copies of both in the library. You said word families. Do you mean words that are similar? In a way, yes. It means that all the different grammatical forms of a word are listed together. So you can see the nouns, verbs, adjectives, forms with prefixes and suffixes and so forth. It'll be clearer when you look at it. Anyway, Avril Coxhead gives you really great hints about how to learn the words, so it shouldn't be too daunting. The trouble is, I tend to forget the words I learn. Well, there are two ways you can tackle that. First, always try to learn the words in a context. Either learn a whole sentence using a word, or learn a phrase that the word typically comes in. We call phrases like that collocations. That's a new one on me. Collocations. I'd better make a note of it. You do that. You can find collocations in most modern dictionaries. Anyway, as I was saying, there's a second study aid I recommend for vocabulary learning. When you get an assignment, take a sheet of paper and write four headings. Words I can use, words I can recognise but can't use, words I'm not sure of, words I don't know. Don't bother with the simple words, of course. Then go back after two weeks and look at the list again. Can you move any of the words into a better column? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part four. You will hear a tutor giving some business students instructions about a finance project. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Okay, can you quieten down, please? Now, today, I'm going to talk to you about your assignment. We've been studying the effects of the exchange rate, so I'm going to give you a project to do on this. Right, can you make some notes while I'm talking? The first thing that I'd like you to do in order to prepare this is to select where you're interested in. I mean, which country, and therefore, which currency you're going to be operating in. OK, now, the purpose of the project is to make money, and I'm hoping some of you will make a significant amount. So, I want you to suppose that you have £100 that you will have to invest purely in the rises and falls of the exchange system. In other words, you'll be trying to predict rates. This is a project that you'll be doing together, but before you work together, you'll have to go off and research what you need to know about the economy of that country and how well it's doing or is expected to do in the near future. You could all make up a little information sheet with your notes on, clearly legible, because then I want you to get together, we can do that next week, and to go round and read about each other's countries. When you see how well or badly each country is doing, I want you to decide what your exchange rate is going to be against all the other currencies. After that is all sorted, what you're going to do is go round the other students and attempt to sell your money to the others. Remember, this will depend on the success of your country's economy and the rate you fixed for your currency. 
Now, you're not allowed to just swap currencies with each other, but you may wish to buy from the other countries. But you must do a proper transaction. All the way through this, you must keep your accounts properly for each transaction. I'll give you one week to do this, and then we will set a time for the deals to finish, a bit like the stock exchange. And at that point, I will ask you to calculate how much you have made. Is that clear? You now have 30 seconds to read questions 37 to 40. OK, now before you begin that, there are a few things I want you to read up on to prepare. You need to look at the economies of the UK's main trading partners. I don't mean all of them, because that would be over 80, but just the 29 principal ones. There are summaries in the last three books on the book list I've given you. And so that you can practice applying the criteria on assessment I gave you, I'd then like you to focus just on one sector across all the countries. The most common one across every country is farming. But as much agricultural produce is for domestic consumption, I'd like you to look at manufacturing. Then I would like you to do a detailed investigation of one particular aspect. I was going to give you a choice, but I think as we've just started the course, it's better if we all look at the same thing and then we can discuss it in the seminars. So the thing I'd like you all to look at is fluctuations in import prices. Now, you need to do all that before you start the project as it will help you assess the economies of the countries you'll be representing in the project. Don't worry, you've got plenty of time. Exam week is December the 8th, then it's the holidays until January the 6th, so I don't need the project in till February the 5th. Is that okay? Now, any questions on this? Because it's That is the end of part four.